All right, and we're back. So you had just rolled to see if you had known this uncharacteristically drow character who seemed out of place. And once you notice this predominant red gemstone on his chest, you then realize that this could be none other than the fabled drow of legend, a drow gone good to fight in basically the adventurer of adventurers in drow form, the drow of destruction, known to wield an explosive sword with a familiar, a pet if you will, of an electric dragon, but you do not see such dragon on him. You own. Sorry. Gazintai. You only know of this drow by legend. You have never met this drow in person, but this is a childhood idol, a villain gone good, if you will. You are very starstruck, to say the least. Not so much fangirling, but. It is quite an honor to see a legend, just like the legend of Ildrad, the Knoll of the Forest kind of deal. Okay. I do my best not to stare. Oh, yes, uh, Vivian says. She motions a hand towards the drow. And as I would expect you would have come to know, the... Fable Drow here. This is Sabrak Devian, our uh, head of the Adventurers Guild and predominant leader of the council here. He will, in fact, be your escort for this exact adventure, taking notes on all of your doings to report back to us for your authentication. All right. Takes a few steps closer, as if to actually get up and personal with you, and gives you a once-over. Kind of a sneer look goes across his face. You really think you have what it's got to be in the Adventurers Guild? He questions. Yes, I honestly do. Not so sure of yourself, seems like. I'm not so sure of myself? Need I repeat myself? You're not the epitome of confidence. Well, when standing before a great adventurer such as yourself, it's a little hard to be 100% to be confident in yourself. Ha! <laughs> Look, sucking up will get you nowhere. <laughs> but I appreciate it. He says with a twinge of general thanks in his voice. It's not seemed the most emotional of people. Uh, y yes, yes, uh, Lyle chimes up. Uh, we we uh, have uh, quite a myriad of, of going on with the Adventurers Guild here, but um, uh, as, as you can see, I'm in a mess right now. I've, I've, I've been trying to redo some work and some papers, but um, we... Uh, we, we've got we've got a major issue here over in the uh, local mausoleum. Uh, I, th I think would be the uh, a prime example of what we can uh, expect to see from you uh, to uh, put through your application proper. I, th I say. Vivian says, "You see, Steelwater has had a number of missing reports of people in the local cemetery. So it be that." a lot of undocumented treasures and undocumented flowers and offerings have been appearing around the central mausoleum. Now, need this be an overflow of wealth would be not an issue, but those, even the guards we have sent to collect or at least investigate such things have gone missing, reported disappeared, and we fear the worst at this point. And you want me to go? What if I disappear? Well, well uh, uh, the the halfling chimes up, looking over a paper very, 
very quickly. Well, you, you see, we're gonna have we're gonna have Fabric here go go with you, but um, this, this is like a like a test, as we said. Um, if if you go missing, then I, I unfortunately, needless to say, you're you're not gonna you're not gonna get the job. Uh, roll a d roll a d twenty for perception, real quick. Okay. Nine. Nine. <laughs> I actually nine is good enough. Um, it is blatantly obvious that, that this halfling might not have his stuff together. But basically, you kind of feel like he's either sending you to your doom or sending you to take care of something. That he doesn't know what to do, like he's out of options at the moment. You're very unsure of his intentions. But you don't feel like he bears any ill will against you. you well, well, you see, Vivian here has, has informed me that this... Uh, that this issue is probably probably uh, on the smaller side, but we the people we have sent in are not exactly of the Adventurers Guild. We would not like send someone as good as Mr. Jevy on here in like uh, two three. We would send something like the Royal Guard then. Vivian chimes back up. We have reason to believe that it's a reoccurring uh, character we have seen uh, from time to time, and we we are very confident that you can handle such a character. Alright. I guess it's as he said. I'll rather return and be a part of the... be a part... <laughs> Sorry, my family's making ruckus. And I'll rather be part, part of the council or I won't return and I'll have been sent to my doom. Either way, it'll be a good adventure, right? Well, well, unfortunately, it's not going to be so much about the adventure or having fun. He air quotes. It's 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 mainly just to see how well you're going to do in such situations of extreme stress. Uh, Fabric here is going to be essentially not a bodyguard, but he he's he's going to see that you don't get you to your un, un, untimely demise, but uh, to rather pull you out and save the day if 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 need be. All right, I don't think it'll be needed. But I'll appreciate the protection, I suppose. Vivian chimes up once more. Well, the uh, to put it shortly like this, the... Have you had any history with the undead? She questions to you very cautiously. No, not right off the top of my head. Okay. She notes down on a piece of paper and ha have you any issues predominantly with the undead other than the fact they're a living contradiction not very much well you, you, you see they're, they're, they're uh, the, the main issue here Vivian kind of stops Lyle in his tracks and says this specific character is a well Look, the best way to put it is he's a necromancer. But but don't but don't alarm yourself. He is a very old and out of date necromancer known as Farnell the Hollow. He is on death's doorsteps to sound contradictive enough. We we feel like he is about to keel over in his grave, but he still manages to shamble to a secluded spot and try to sucker in poor souls for expected reasons. She motions to you as if you would get that strong enough hint. She says, well, we don't believe him to put up much of a fight, but he is a necromancer, and we would rather much someone remove him from the premises one way or another. And and the and the council is, is more than willing to to put a blind eye to whatever fate this Farnell should should uh, 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 fall to, Lyle says. Didn't catch that last part. Lyle stresses that he that the the council will basically overlook whatever fate falls to this necromancer. Okay. I can deal with that. But would you prefer him alive or dead? I know you said it doesn't matter, but which would you honestly prefer? Well, un unfortunately, it's, it's not the council's 
uh, jurisdiction of what this necromancer falls to. He, he, he is, he's not a member of, of this specific uh, municipality or... Well, he, he, he is not of this... We, we, would prefer, we would prefer him not to be in this town. What, what his fate falls to is, is not of our concern, and we, we, Vivian stops him and says, We really don't care. She blatantly puts it across. All right. She wavers you a map to the local cemetery, she says. Uh, I'm fairly certain, as a local of Steelwater, you are very familiar with this specific cemetery here. But here's a map in case you should need one. She hands over to you. Oh, we have an advertisement. Yeah, over on my end. Sorry. No problem. So she gives you a map of the still water on the way to... that points out towards the graveyard. And, um... She says, We've also taken apart the liberty to supply you with a few extra... well, bonuses, she says. A, a few nails in, in the final coffin here, excuse expression, that will no doubtly solidify your position here in the Adventurer's Guild. A test within a test, so to speak. Lyle rummages through his desk and pulls out um, a little green rune, a stone with runes covering it, about the size to fit in someone's hand. Uh, th this, this here is basically going to uh, be like a gambler's test, he says. Th this magical rune here will basically be an aid to your uh, adventure, but it will also uh, show what you can do in, in times of stress beyond control. He hands over this rune to you. Alright, do I have to put it in a specific place, or can I just put it in my little pouch over here? Uh, you can store it in your pouch. Uh, the drow then chimes up and says, Now, this rune here is a summoner's rune. Have you heard of such thing? No. Okay. It works like this. If you hold the rune, basically you can summon a random magical weapon. And I'm pretty sure uh, the Harfling here has programmed in a number of weapons, but don't expect all of them to be perfect, or what you'd expect. It's a weapon gamble, if you will. The Halfling chimes up. Yes, yes it, uh, basically, it randomized weapons to basically uh, test how you can react to certain situations when put in, well, not so certain situations. Alright. Sounds interesting. Well, a lot of new things I've never heard of before. Vivian goes over a few more documentation. She flips over a few more papers. Well, and basically, in a nutshell, I believe that's about all we need. Um, if you can return with Mr. Devian here and uh, have verifiable proof that this necromancer has been dealt with and Devion here can vouch for you, then uh, you are more than welcome in the Adventurer's Guild as a prime party member. Okay. Is, is, is there uh, in, anything else we can uh, possibly supply for you or any, any any specific demands or questions or concerns you would need from us? This little mm. chairman of a man ponders. Not at this moment in time. I'm sure if I have any questions, this kind gentleman can answer them. I'm not going to lie, I completely forgot the dude's name. This drow is Sabrak. T-S-A-B-R-A-K. Sabrak. 
Deevian. Okay. You can call him Sabrak or Deevian or what the Drow, whatever you would like. I'm sure if I have any questions, the the kind Drow here can answer them for me. They all give a very understandable look. Uh, you can tell by now that this halfling has been sweating, sweating his head off like he is nervous beyond compare. But you kind of ex half expected this from a chairman of the council, but possibly not this nervous. Obviously, he do he's not sure if there's any other option except for to send a new one there. Um, I don't it, know it, what I'm trying to say. No problem. If if, if you're all, if you're all good to go, then uh, then uh, Devion here will will uh, uh, show you on the way, and uh, uh, we we wish you luck on on your adventure, and we we hope to see you uh, hopefully at the next adventures guild meeting. All right. Uh, you turn to the side. Devian is waiting by that single door, noticeably now the only entrance to this circular room. And ask, are you coming? On my way. All right. He pulls out another specialized key, similar to the one the human coachman had. Inserts it into the door. The door opens up, and there is no longer a carriage there, but you are in the middle, basically the streets of Steelwater. As he closes the door behind you, you turn around to see that there is no longer a door. There is only the side of a market store that you apparently walked right through. You have word to believe that this is some sort of magical hidden entrance or teleportating door of some kind. Best way to... Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was say, um, we're assuming it's a, a teleporting door. You think it's some sort of magical device, as you've apparently just walked through a door that's now not there. Okay. As Sabrick puts the key back into his pockets. Best way to keep the council hidden, you see. No one knows, only those with the keys have entrance. All right. So, now that we're not in the way of uh, Vivian and the Runt here, let me ask you a few questions. How much adventuring experience have you had? He questions. I've done some advent fr from side there. I've done some side jobs here and there, but no truly danger entailing ones, just ones of finding relics and such. Ah, excursions. Well. We'll see how that goes over, he says. Are you good with everything? He half poses to you. He says, what do you even have? I see you've got your hammer there, but do you even... Sorry for the sounding like this, but do you even have anything? He questions. Yes, I have a sword, some rope, black powder. Little basic things. I'm pretty good with a sword. Okay, because, well, it's not mine to judge, because, no, I don't really expect you to make the grade here, no offense, but a true adventurer must be ready for any circumstance that blows his way, he says. He pulls aside one of the side cloaks he is wearing, and you notice that he is, true to his legend, decked out. He not only has this very large greatsword, which you would presumed to be the explosive sword of legend. You see a few more dragon tooth daggers. He also has, um, as a, you see his basic adventures kit on the back of his belt, he's got several vials of different liquids and powders. And you even notice a few health vials, as well as some wooden stakes belted on his chest. He says it's best to be prepared is all I'm getting at. I stare in awe. That's about all I can do. He covers back up his little menagerie of potions and such. So, do you need to shop or anything, or are you good to go? He says, looking up, no taking notice that it is just about sunset now. 
Are there any potion shops around? Uh, yes, there is a potion shop around the corner. You may go avail yourself to. Uh, can I get some health? Post something to help recover me if I get damaged. Uh, Severick courts you around the corner to the local potion shop and go inside and the magistrate at the counter asks what he can do for you and shows you his myriad of potions and you take the once over and you inquire about health potions he says he's got several different kinds he's asked he specifically questions to you what kind of potions do you want instant healing do you want something like a throwing potion of healing something that will cause invulnerability for a while can I get some instant healing and some, um, in, did you say invul- Yes, invulnerability, to, to be able to have a magical shield around oneself for a short while. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, it, my, my apologies, uh, that one's a bit strong. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I get some inv- in- Invincibility. Yeah, invincibility and, and instant healing. <laughs> instant healing. Um, he gives you a small vial. Let me mark this on your items as well. A small vial. He tells you it is ingestible. It's about probably not even a swallow's worth. Of very red glowing liquid. Does not look as thick as blood, but very bright, very mm, radiant, that's the word. He says, this is uh, the invulnerability here. He says, one uh, one swig of this and you will ha have a temporary magical field that will protect you from all physical damage for a matter of minutes. So make it count, he says. Alright, that's about all I need. And he says, and did you uh, a, f a few vials of um, instant health. Yes, w would you prefer this to be of uh, application or, or, or ingestible, he says. Application would probably be quicker. Alright, he gives you two more vials which are shaped more in an hourglass figure, he says. Just toss this on yourself, pour this on yourself, or if need be, crush the vial and drip it on yourself and you will instantly surge with healing magic which will take your health up for whatever it can do for you so he gives you two vials of instant health alright that should cover it you pay up and you set out out of the shop it is just about sunset people are less people are littering the streets the uh, lamps are beginning to turn on as Day turns into night. Where are we off to next? We're I'm off... ready to go if you are. Okay. We're off to the mausoleum, he says. Kind of a half look at you like you should know where we're going. But you don't take it personally, as you know this is probably the nature of this drow. He then lets out a mighty whistle from which a small little screech is heard from a few houses over. You uh, instantly see Savrick hold out his arm as a small pseudo-dragon comes flying around the corner and lands on his arms like a falcon. Here I have another cue for him. Here is a little pseudo-dragon that is now perched on his arm. About Aww. the size of a, uh, a hawk, a large, you know, falcon of sorts. It is a small little pseudo-dragon, blue as your scales, tiny little white eyes, uh, spikes leading down his back. This, this is Relin, the drow says to you. He is my familiar. He is a beast of wonder. Dragon twitches back and forth as he looks at you quizzically as he hobbles up on the drow's shoulder very contently as you make your way down the streets around the corners to the local cemetery you arrive at the cemetery gates to which it is now 
dark. It is now nighttime. The local lamps are on, lighting the way. The cemetery is mainly flatlands. You see graves here and there, as expected, and a very predominant mausoleum, a, a large stone structure in the middle, quite a ways away. The drow says, well, at this point, from here on, I'm just following. I'll get you out of any issues that you come up against, but only if you really need it. All right. As he takes a few steps back, he pulls out a little scratch pad, and a little charcoal stick, which he scratches a few words and tucks back into his pocket. And folds his arms, looks at you with a puzzling look, and motions after you. I head to the mausoleum while checking out the, the cemetery and surroundings to see if there's anything suspicious going on on the outside. Alright, roll a d20 for me. 13. Alright. Of course, there, you do not notice there is nobody here other than the, uh, the two of you and the pseudo-dragon. There is the ambient noises of the neighboring houses beyond the fencing of this, you know, about four or five acre wide by, you know, about 16 acre cemetery here. Um, the A cart or two pass behind you guys at the main road, but the ambient noises of the owls and, you know, ambient crickets and creatures of the night, but nothing strikes you odd. The, there are graves here and there of the nobles and the majesties that have died from still water, and um, several graves are adorned with flowers and charms and offerings of all sorts. As you begin to near the mausoleum, you notice that the door is open. One of the two main stone doors is cracked open. I enter. As you get up to the main steps, you pull open the door. It opens with very much ease. You notice that there is no latch on the door, as expected, but you were surprised it is open. The As soon as you open the door, the interior is dark. There is no lights, but you... From the moonlight from the outside beaming into the what you can see from this opening doorway, you instantly see about five or six gold coins just scattered on the floor, right in front of your feet, you're stepping on. Um, do a quick check to find out if it's a trap. Alright, you're a dwarf, you're good with stone cutting, um, do you think you would have any bonuses for this? Like, do you think you have made traps in your olden days or something of the sort? Anything you think would give you a one-up here? Well, if I w uh, I am indeed a dwarf, so I probably have done many a mine, so more than likely I'd have run across quite a few traps. Maybe okay. not have built any of my own, but seen some. Okay. Uh, roll a d20. Eleven. Eleven. I will give you at least a plus three, so that is fourteen. I'll give it to you. Um, you're very familiar with all sorts of different kinds of traps, even though you have not made any or particularly built any yourself. Um, you don't believe this is any sort of trap. These are just regular gold coins lying here on the floor. He's in touch. You pick them up, examine them, examine them once over. They are indeed gold coins. They are just your average treasury. I think odd or I put off them about in my them. little money pouch. You start collecting treasure. Yeah. You have reached the edge of the 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 opening doorway where there is no more moonlight to stream in. You are just underneath the awning of the door, so to speak. The room is pitch black. You cannot see a thing. Okay, I... Is there anything wood around me when I walked in? Uh, would you like to feel around for something? Yes, like a wood handle or something. Right. Or can I back out? You can do whatever Try you'd like. I'll go back to where the moonlight is so I can create something for light. You step back out to so where you can see. Um, I pick up a rather large stick 
and use some cloth out of my pocket or pouch and the gunpowder to create a small torch. You happen to pull out a, uh, a few, a very large uh, torch handle. Uh, you have a few of them in your adventures kit. And use a scrap of cloth from your adventures kit to fashion a, a torch, which you expect will burn for a short while, but probably enough to get you to the next available light source, hopefully. And you fashion a torch, which glows bright in your hand. And then I go back in. Step back in. Uh, the torch uh, lights up the room. You are in a about a 20 foot by 20 foot room. The drow stands behind you in the doorway, still just taking notice. The He glances over the coins on the ground, but does not make any attempt to pick them up or so much interest in them. He is focusing on you, as you would expect. You, The room itself is very bland. There are windows to the side, but they are barred up in such a way with heavy stained glass that the moonlight does not stream inwards. Uh, there is a main altar at the back, as well as a lift system you can make out at the back. You uh, <laughs> now realize, of course, uh, this is the place, uh, this is the entrance to the catacombs down below. They would prepare the body up in this main room and lower it down the lift to be placed in the catacombs down below. Uh, in addition to these six little coins at the beginning, you now see the floor is dotted with more and more treasure leading towards the lift at the back. As well as coins, you see a few small gemstones as well. Do I see any weapons around? The room is very barren with some uh, tools you would expect to be used for preparing um, a body for, you know, uh, to be placed in the catacombs. Some exemplary tools, nothing of actual weaponry. Okay, do I hear anything, ha um, any commotions from down below? Roll a d20. Eleven. Eleven. With the still of the night, you can faintly make out some warble of some bestial tone. You are unsure what it is, or what it even said, or what being it may be. As well as the faint, almost the muffled scream of something. Possibly this muffled scream sounds more intelligent than this bestial warble you sound you heard. Um Is it a scream like someone's in danger? You believe so. Okay, I go bolting down the stairs to see if see if there's someone in danger. Well, it is actually a lift system. You go around the side of the altar and there is essentially a it's like a large dumb waiter which would fit like Two passengers and a large coffin to be lowered down into the catacombs below, so to speak. There is a lever to your right, which obviously looks like it activates the lift. Okay, then I'll use that to go down and make and see if there's um, who's in danger, who's screaming. Davian joins you on the lift as you pull the lever, and the lift takes you down very slowly. You can hear the chains clanking along the sides. Alright, now for the viewers, finally we get to change something up here. They get to stop looking at still water and get to look at their next little viewing session here. Alright, I'll try to change this mid-recording and see how well this does. Am I moving ahead of schedule for you? No, you are, you are just about on schedule. I don't have these things planned out time-wise, but... I had plans to change this over for the viewer, viewer's pleasure to try to keep up with something else. So here we go. This is uh, now what the viewers see, and I will also show this to you as this is our next cue. Um, what you see next, uh, you are lowered down to a small little gathering area to which it opens up down a very lengthy set of stairs leading down to the catacombs themselves. These stairs are aligned with treasures galore and bones throughout the ages. A uh, couple steps and all sorts. Here is a... There we go. Here is your cue, and this is also what the viewers see. This is what you see now as the lift comes to a stop. Items throughout the ages lining the walls is this very elongated flight of steps. The 
Uh, the picture here only references so much. The steps are about three times as long as this. But there are torches lining the sides. There is a room to your left and a room to your right, or at least an opening to a room to your left and an opening to a room to your right before the grandiose set of steps. I go to the room on my left. All right, you go to the room on your left. Um, from first initial glance, you can see that both rooms turn the corner like kind of like a waiting room of sorts. Roll another d20 for me. 17. 17. All right. From here, you instantly hear that war a little bit more of that warbling as well as another muffled panic scream. And it is very clear to you now. It seems to be right around the same corner you are turning. There is a small archway opening that leads into whatever room you are about to enter to, which you have heard the noises from. I place my hand on my weapon and prepare for the worst as I round the corner? You want to upright and just round the corner right in the doorway? I, I just peek around to see if I can see what's going on. Peek around the corner. Alright. As you peek around the corner, you, not, you take notice that this room is a, a very large room with furnaces lining the wall. You, you would imagine this would be a, the crematorium room of, of some sorts. As the, there are more like furnaces lining the far back walls. You peek around the corner a little bit more to see this very daunting, unholy creature struggling with this human that has been bound and gagged. This creature is trying to put this human on a... well, a, a one of these slabs that leads into this oven machine, so to speak. Uh, roll a d20 to see if you know what this creature is. I landed, like, right in the middle. I got an 11. An 11. All right. Uh, do you think you would have any bonuses for creature identification, especially of the undead sort? Well, I did tell the people, the council people, I had no experience with the undead, so... Okay, so you don't think you would have much, much knowledge other than probably common knowledge. unless he resembles another beast I've seen... In previous adventures, I wouldn't know much about him. Alright. Uh, you do not know what this creature is, but I will give you a uh, view, and as well as probably the viewers as well. The viewers will probably see it first, and um, of course, uh, viewers, I, I uh, all, all these pictures are of uh, respected, uh, the respected artists who have uh, drawn these, um, and for probably, possibly copyright sakes as well, I'm not going to probably show all of these. I'm probably just going to show the settings. So, sorry people out there, but I will describe them as best as I can. Um, this creature that is struggling with this bound and gagged human, you can only really see the back of this creature, but you can tell that this, um, this is a creature known as a bone claw. You do not know this name, but I will give you the name. It is a large skeletal creature that basically looks like it would be wearing robes, but the robes are actually made out of just straight up muscle off of this creature. It has a bony skull head and elongated uh, muscular arms revealing three large talon knife claws. A very tall, slender, daunting, undeadly figure with glowing eyes and just, it just bears of bad news. Got it? Yeah. Alright, this creature is struggling to try and get this human on this tray, one of the trays that leads into the oven, which you now notice is lit and going. Okay, I... a little... trying to hide my fear, charge in to try and save the human. Alright, let's roll initiative, which unfortunately you don't need to do because you are a solo player tonight. Alright. Uh, you take one glance behind you, and the drow is standing back in the main hallway, peering around the corner at you, not getting in the way. Um, you instantly see him pull out a small vial of blue liquid and toss down at his feet, which erupts into a small little poof of smoke. You instantly see him 
vanish from his toes to his head. Invisibility. He has he teleported or is he now invisible? You can tell he is now he is not teleported, but he is now invisible. Um you obviously give a shocked look as this person has now left you for dead, so to speak. The pseudo dragon on his shoulder lets off a small little discharge of static. You can from though he is invisible, you do see this little small play of static, letting you know that he is still there, but he is invisible. You probably right. assume this is be to stay out of your way. Or at least you All hope right. so. Um... I... What are you doing with the human? This creature reels around as it hears your words. It does not seem... Well, th this human now takes notice of you, but is still desperately trying to free itself. This creature rolls around and speaks in some dead language of warbled mess, almost like this creature may not even have a tongue. But it is not intelligible. You cannot make out whatever this creature is saying. It bears towards you claws agape. It does what? It comes towards you, ready to slash you up. Um, I dodge and try to counter. Alright, I will roll a first slash. Uh, roll a d20. Uh, I rolled a 14 that did not hit your armor class, so it bounces straight off your armor. What would you like to do? Um, try to strike him back as he passes, passes by me. Alright, he... This is a creature which we'll now have... AC of 12. Roll a d20. If you get better than a 12, you have hit the creature. I got a 12. You got a 12. Alright. I will actually take that. Uh, roll a d6 for damage. 6. 6. Alright. Uh, I'm guessing you use your maul. Yes. Which side of your maul and where do you hit? Axe and I... Go for the stomach. Go for the mid region. He's a, he's obviously going to be taller than me. I'm a dwarf, so the stomach yes, will probably creature, be the easiest place for me to hit. This creature is probably about seven, eight feet tall. This is a tall creature. Um, strike it right in its midsection, throwing it off. That is an instantly twenty damage. It is down to eighty. A strong hit. Um, this creature, taken aback by your just straight up brute force, will kind of waltz backwards. You you notice that its muscle of cloak, or cloak of muscle, if you will, does not reveal any feet of any sort. It kind of just glides on its appendage, if you will. Um, this creature does kind of withdraw from you very hastily, and uses one hand to try and force this human down as it tries to use its other hand to shove this oven closed. It seems more preoccupied by getting this human in this burning oven than with you. I run up behind him and try and strike him again to pr and get the human loose. You want to try to hit him again with advantage. Uh, roll again. Roll a d20. I will give you advantage. Fourteen. Fourteen. No need. None needed. What do you hit? How do you hit? Um. I'll try and strike him in the ha strike him in the shoulder or something to prevent him from pushing the human into the oven. Okay. Roll a d6 for damage. <sighs> Wrong dice. Five. Five. Still a good strong hit. I will take. Uh, I will take uh, another fifteen off of that. So. Eighty minus fifteen. So this thing is now at sixty-five health. This thing has reeled back, and will use one attempt to swipe at you with one hand still on the oven door, but not necessarily. Tr it, 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 its focus has been taken off of the human. It has okay. rolled 11, and you easily deflect this, th its, its massive claws. Okay, I try to run past him and pull the human off the, off the, the thing it's on. You want to snag the human off of this uh, shelf. 
Uh, the shelf is about mid-height, uh, the middle drawer of, uh, think of a block of nine, it would be the middle drawer. It is not too high for you to grab, but it is not at optimal height from you. Uh, roll a contest with me to grab this human off before this thing notices. D20. I got a ten. Good, I rolled a, 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 a natural one. <laughs> you instantly yank this human off, and it has now seemed to have lost you to underneath this drawer you are now hiding from because of its tall stance. It cannot see you to underneath the oven drawer. I use my dagger and try and cut him loose. Cut the human loose. Alright, you, cut, you uh, cut through the human's bonds on his hands. Uh, roll a d20 for perception. Natural 20. Natural 20, all right. Um, you also hear from the other room, the adjacent room you were at at the beginning, you hear more similar screaming. Uh, similar all screaming right. as well as another warbled contingency of noise. This bone claw in front of you has lost you. It seems to be looking around the room, confused of where you two have gone. Um... I take advantage of his complete confusion and try and go in for for a he head strike. Try and kill him. You want to surprise him and, and basically just just nail him right in the head. Roll a d20. You gotta beat twelve. Remember. Fourteen. Fourteen. All right, for a head strike, I will actually give you this bonus for a uh, surprise. I will shoot. I will give you a natural twenty for this. Anything specific you want to do? I'm pretty sure this will probably kill the creature. Anything special? You he, want to he, do? He's bone, right? He his skull is bone, but he's wearing like a cloak of muscle. Okay, so since I'm going for the 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 head area, I'll use the hammer and try and smash his skull in. All right, you do this amazing acrobatics thing as you use this drawer to vault yourself up on top of the drawer and bring this hammer down like a whack-a-mole on this creature. <laughs> uh, so with with, with uh, I I will give you I will give you a, I uh, just because I will give you strength bonus because of a dwarf and I will just give you sneak attack bonus because he has uh, lost you. Just giving you a straight up d20. So you bring this hammer down right on its head. You smash this skull down into its torso. It falls. The creature is no more. Yay! The human now pulls the binding off of its, off of his mouth and says, Quick, my sister! As he points to the other room. Alright, I give him my sword as, as a piece of weaponry and charge in with him. Alright, you have given your short sword to this human. As a way for him to defend himself. Okay. Um, you charge into the other room and notice a very similar situation. There is another bone claw shoving a human in the furnace. And he is just about to push the human in there. As you can see, the sister, as you do, uh, can guess, is bound and gagged as well. But she is not struggling. She Good seems lord, to how many of the how many of you guys are there? It's just me and her. We we, we came out here looking for look, looking for the treasure everyone was telling us about. The human seems very afraid. Alright. I try and get the bone creature's attention by tossing a rock I find on the floor at him. All Distract right. him from pushing her in there. All right, roll a d20 to lob a rock. Eh, 17. 17. All right, you happen to find a pebble at your foot, and you lob it at this creature. Um, roll another d20. 11. All right, unfortunately, 11 is not going to cut it. This was a very small rock. This creature <laughs> did not take much effect to this pebble that is plonked him upside the shoulder as he pushes this oven door closed. The human try, runs past you screaming, No! And will make a strike at this bone creature. He rolls a 17 and slashes it upside the back as he closes the door. Um, I will take a good 20 off of this creature as it still has an AC of 12. This creature reels around as the oven door is now closed and the 
oven is on. This flames engorge as this machine whirs. Is there any hope for the human? You are not sure unless you can get to them and pull them out quickly. Um, the human did not seem to be flailing like the like the boy did. He's the the girl seemed to be unconscious almost. Uh, the bone creature will take a swipe at this human with a 16, which is more than enough, and give a good slash to the torso. Uh, this human will take a good 30 damage, as this is not a skilled adventure. He's down to 70. Um, I He's distracted by the human, right? He is fighting with the human. Okay, I take my hammer and try to knock him down to size by slamming him in the back. Alright, you want to run behind him and basically knock him over or just strike him in the back? Yeah, I want to try and knock him over. Alright, roll I a d20. Use him as a stepping stool to get up to the human. Well, you, it, it's, it, you believe you'd be able to reach the, the door by yourself. It's not that short to the ground. Okay. Well, I'll try to do that since he's distracted by the human. You want to try to open the door, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I want to try and get her out since he's distracted with the human right now. Alright, you now see the door has been uh, locked. And it is a uh, latch lock. It is not a key lock, but roll to see if you know how to unlock this lock. Uh, I got a 14. 14, alright. You've seen this before, but you also notice that this lock has been a little bit busted, probably ripped open by whatever this creature is. So this door is now jammed. Do you want to try and pry it open? Um, by now I would assume the human is. The human will take a strike against a bone claw, trying to, in its in bridal rage, he will take another 10 off. The bone claw is now down to 70. The bone claw will retaliate with an 8 and barely miss this human as he dodges to the side. Okay, I'm going to try and knock the, knock the beast down and, and open the door. Alright, you want to strike the creature? Yeah, I want to try and... Sh well, no, he's still distracted. I'll try and get the door. Alright, uh, you can think you can use your uh, pick mall to pro probably pry this door open. Uh, roll a contest with me, d20. I rolled a 17. I, I got a 16. Alright, your pick barely clips off a corner of the door as the door f fails. You did not pry this door open. Uh, the, this oven is now churning with fire. You are pretty sure at this point this human probably does not have any hope left. Alright, I'll turn my attention to the beast. Alright. Roll it if you're going to strike, as usual. B to 12. B to 12? Uh, what if I get an 11? You did not. Uh, this creature is flailing with this human enough you happen to miss straight up. Uh, the, cu the human will try and retaliate with a nat 1. He loses his footing and falls prone as his bone claw retaliates with a 19 and skewers the human right through the back, giving another 30 damage. This human is down to 40. He is not looking good. Um, okay. I'm going to try and strike the monster to get his attention tor turned towards me. All right, roll so it. So he leaves the poor guy alone. I will give you advantage. A sneak attack. I got 19. 19, plenty. Uh, you strike this creature, roll d6 for damage. I'll actually give you advantage on that. I got a 3. 3, I'll give it a 4. You take a good 15 off of that. This creature is now focused back on you and has left the human alone. The creature is down to 55. Creature will try to retaliate against you. It was a 13. You glance off of your armor. Did not even brush you. <laughs> I'm lucky. <laughs> As he tries to strike me, I try and counter by using the axe head, the axe side of my pick maul and, and striking him in in the stomach with it. All right, roll it. Eighteen. Eighteen. A powerful hit. Roll a d6. Six. Alright. It's another good 20 chunk of health. This thing is now down to 35. This thing is almost bloodied. 
the human will try to clamber to his feet, but stay a good distance away from this creature for the time being as he tries to gather himself. He is now bleeding, of course. Okay. Um, I'm still going at it with the, the monster, so... Go for it. Hack slash. <laughs> I'll try and, and, and strike him like I did the last guy. I'll try and strike him in the head. All right, remember, you can be as fancy about these things as you want. Remember, I am up to anything. So roll it. Seventeen. Seventeen. Another powerful hit. Uh, straight on the head. Uh, what side of the pick do you use? I'll use the axe this time. Use the axe. All right, roll a d6. I got a three. All right, average. Uh, I will take a good 10 off of that. The creature's now down to 25 as your pick cracks through its skull. And this creature reels back and begins to frenzy. This creature will now try and hit much more ferociously, but is not exactly accurate. We'll try and retaliate against you with a 19. But because it is frenzied and... Yep. And breaking up. Not anymore. You stopped. All right. All right, this creature rolled a 19, which does hit your armor class, but it is frenzied, and you do have a good predominant crack through its head, so it will not be as accurate. So a d6, it rolled a 1, it will actually do half damage to you. So, uh, though it does hit you, you lose only 2 hit points. You were at 98, it barely gra gla grazes your arm. You hardly felt it. This creature is now manically flailing. This human will come back in for the final kill and drive a... Sword through its back with a glorious 18. And he rolls a glorious 4. This sword goes through the creature's chest. You can see it poke out on your side. The creature falls. The creature is no more. Alright, I give him my apologies for his sister's passing. The good luck of shock goes over his face as he tries to take in what has happened. Um, roll a d20 for me, for perception. Seven. Seven. All right, well, you are right next to the oven, so I will actually give that to you. A very loud clang, or a thump, if you will, is heard from inside this oven. In hopes that the human's still alive, I use my pick mall and try and get it open once more. You will try to pry the door open again. Contest with me once more. With a, do you want a D20 or a D12? Um, we can, I don't think I have a D12. I don't know. What does a D12 look like? Right, a D12 is a 12-sided die. It's like a D20, but 12 sides. I don't... Well, let me see. I might have one. I don't know! Or what would you like to contest with? you got a contest. Hey, no, that's a D20. Hey, I got one. Okay. D12 contest. Yeah. I rolled a 3. I got an 11. 11. You managed to pry this door open. It comes right off of its hinges after that second try. There is immediate fire. Blows back out into your face like a backdraft. You stumble back with this. This thing starts bellowing fire. A very ethereal groan of agony is now heard from within this fire bellowing from the oven. Um, can I use my pick maul to try and pull the tray out? So I'm not burnt too bad? Yes, you, you manage through these spitting flames to hook into the edge of the tray and slide this tray out. There is nothing but a corpse of charred what, whatever clothings it was holding. a just a plain up charred skeleton with charred clothing. It, it is spewing massive amounts of fire. S such an amount you would not expect from just a burning corpse. This thing is unnaturally emanating fire, you now realize. Another large ethereal groan of agony, even louder than before, revels from this corpse as you now see one of its hands begin to rise up. Alright, so... Perception or intelligence check? 
Uh, go for intelligence. The, these things are well known. I'm sorry, I'm throwing dice here. Hey! I got a 16, not too bad. Alright. You ha it, it, they are very rare and very rarely heard of in any community, especially the necrotic community. But you know this creature, if it is true, to be an effigy. Alright, and with that we have hit exactly one hour recording. Let's stop this session and we'll continue in just a bit. Alright, quick question. What's an effigy? effigy? We will continue that at our next continuation. All right.